So let's look at the first patient. There are three pictures here. One of the patient's mouth, one of his hands, and one of his chest wall. And feel free to use the chat at, the, at this time to, to, to tell us what, what findings are present here in this case. And how can you unify it to make a diagnosis? Well, in the first picture, there you go. Great, great. Isaac has it right. So high arch palate, arachnodactyly. There is a chest scar. There's also a chest wall deformity in the form of pectus carinatum. It's kind of difficult to see because of the depth of the, that the photo was taken, but there is a chest wall deformity. And how could you put all of these findings together? What, what are these all suggestive of? What condition? Marfan syndrome, exactly. Perfect, you guys. And so, you know, Again, if, if this information is given to you in this way, these clues are lined up next to each other, these photographs, or on a standardized test, they might simply tell you the patient has a high arched palate, arachnodactyly, and a chest wall deformity. I, I would think that most clinicians, or at least it's much easier to arrive at the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome when these clues are given to you in this way. But you want to be the clinician that can not only synthesize this information and these clues to make the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, but you also want to be the clinician who recognizes that it's important to look in the patient's mouth. Who, When Marfan syndrome, you know, uh, pops into your head or is on your differential, you know that it's important to look at the mouth. Not only is it important to look at the mouth, but you have the skills to identify high arch palate. You know that it's important to look at the patient's hands. Not only that, but you have the skills to identify arachnodactyly. And finally, you know to look at the chest wall and you have the skills to identify a chest wall deformity. That's the complete clinician, one who can do all three steps, not just come up with a diagnosis based on clues that are given to you. And we're not done with this case. This patient presented with dyspnea. So I'll ask you guys again, what condition can patients with Marfan syndrome develop that can lead to shortness of breath? And um, let me ask a more specific question. What, what valvular heart disease do patients with Marfan syndrome develop that can lead to dyspnea? Could be an aortic aneurysm. Exactly. And what does that do to the, uh, when the aorta dilates, what does that do to the, the aortic valve? It dilates that ring and patients with Marfan syndrome can develop aortic regurgitation, which can certainly lead to dyspnea. So now you're thinking aortic regurgitation is a possibility in this case. So now you have a hypothesis. And when you go listen to the heart, now you're anticipating what you might hear in the heart if this patient has aortic regurgitation. And everything in medicine is about anticipation. I never want to order a study where, you know, let's say it's an EKG or even labs. And I, 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 don't, I don't ever want to be surprised by what I see when I order those tests. I want to always be able to anticipate what I might be able to see. And, the, and on an exam, it's, uh, anticipation is critical. The eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. So anticipation is, is key in medicine. And so you anticipate that you might hear a diastolic murmur on exam in this patient when you listen to the heart. And in fact, that's exactly what we hear in this case. So you hear a decrescendo diastolic murmur right over Herb's point, which is consistent with aortic regurgitation. Now, you're thinking aortic regurgitation is uh, very likely in this case. Now, what would you expect to see in the patient's neck? What, what would the carotid pulse look like in a patient with aortic regurgitation? You might expect to see exactly a bounding pulse. And in the neck, this is called Corrigan's pulse. And so you look in the neck with this in mind, and that's indeed exactly what you see, a bounding carotid pulse. And you begin to put all of these clues together and you synthesize these clues and you make a diagnosis in this case of aortic insufficiency. Now, again, you want to be the clinician that is able to acquire these clues 
from the patient's history and their examination to make the diagnosis. It's much easier to just do step three, which is to synthesize this information, but that's not how real life works. You have to, as a clinician, gather the clues that you later use to make the diagnosis.